Welcome back everyone. Halloween is coming up and so I figured let's do some orchestration exercises with Nightmare Before Christmas. Some Danny Elfman in October is always a good idea. So uh, let's get right into it. I'll put the media up on Buy Me A Coffee so that you guys have access to that. As mentioned before, I'll continue to put stuff up on Buy Me A Coffee uh, going forward. Um, but I'll notify you every time something goes up. Uh, so let's get right into it. As you can see here, um, I've done five versions of the same arrangement or the same um, theme fragment. Let's listen to the actual thing that we're going to be looking at. Here it is. Let's play through it so you know what we're talking about. Right? That's the theme. And for the purpose of this exercise, I did not change the tempo in any of these. I did not change the harmonies. I did not change the melody. Everything is derived from the exact same um, material, this piano draft. Normally, when you would adapt something like this to a scene, obviously, you would change a lot of things. But um, this time, I really just want to focus on not the composition, but really just the orchestration. So let's get into it. So the way that I went about all of these is first I decided who's going to play the melody, right? And what is the kind of end goal that I want to achieve? Because whoever you choose to play the melody, that is going to determine a lot of other things, right? Because orchestration in a sense is problem solving. The moment you make one choice, that's going to create problems for other instruments and for the arrangement. And then you have to make follow-up choices to solve those problems that come from your first choice. It's like a domino effect, basically. So the first version that I wanted to do was a really nice lush version with full orchestra, everyone playing full blast. And the way to get this lyrical, old-fashioned, lush sound is by putting the melody into octaves in the high strings, um, and basically double it up endlessly. So that's the first thing I did. I went into violins one, violins two, and violas. Uh, never mind the mock-up. Probably could have done better, but it's just for demonstration. Um, here it is. And this is the melody that I chose, or how I chose to play it. There we go. Then, of course, uh, I have to decide what to do with the low strings. There's really only one option here. Either you could have the celli also play the melody further and then have the bass play the bass note, or this is what I chose to do. I chose to have the bass line in octaves. So let's see what that sounds like together with the high strings. Now this is a good foundation for what we're about to do because we basically have 
the orchestra spread out into every octave of the string section. So that's a good foundation to get this lush sound because you want to spread apart the orchestra as much as you can. And the strings kind of have the biggest range to begin with, so you want to spread those out as much as you can. Now, what is the issue that arises? Well, we have no harmonies. The entire string section is now taken up with the melody and the bass line. So, if I only had strings and woodwinds, I would now have to have the woodwinds fill in the harmonies. Um, but since I want the full orchestra, I chose to have the brass fill in the harmonies because the brass is also a little more present than the woodwinds to begin with. And if everybody's playing, the woodwinds probably wouldn't cut through enough anyway. So um, I chose the brass for the harmonies and I chose to have the woodwinds instead double the strings, which is a very common technique. But I did a little something here. Um, I did that after the fact, actually. At first, I only doubled it exactly with the strings. But so then I thought it was a little bit boring. And so I every time there was a longer sustain that lasted a whole bar, I would break it up into an arpeggio to get some more life into it, some more movement, but also, you know, little flourishes and a couple more harmonies. Um, but so this is what that sounds like. And you, you wouldn't have to do those flourishes. You could also just have it um, have it double exactly the strings. I just wanted something more. And this is what the strings and woodwinds then sound like together. Right? Some of the harmonies are now there, but it's, it's not nearly enough. So next thing I did, obviously brass. Um, the first thing I did is the horns, because the horns, really important now, have to fill in the harmonies. You could also do horns and trombones. It's very common to have them interlock and play the harmonies together. I was just too lazy to mock that up. <laughs> but here we go. Playing chords and the horns around middle C, always a good idea. It doesn't sound too cluttered and it's, you know, in a, in a good range to have closed voicing chords in the horns. And then I have the low brass, um, just play the bass line. And so forth. Again, you could have the trombones also play chords. Um, it's it depends. It's a question of taste. And then just to reinforce the melody, I had the trumpets and a portion of the horns also double the melody. You wouldn't have to do that. It's enough if the strings and woodwinds do this. Um, but it's not uncommon to have like the first horn or the first two horns double the melody and then have the rest of the horns play the chords. So I chose to do that here. 
um, just to make sure the melody is really represented enough. And so forth. And so together, the woodwinds, brass, and strings sound like this. Now this would already be enough, this works. This is nicely balanced, it sounds warm, it, the melody cuts through, we have all the harmonies. So this works perfectly. Um, we wouldn't have to add anything else to this, but me being me, um, I also added a little bit of choir. Um, Cause something that I'm missing here a little bit is feeling that three, four feel. And so um, I added a bunch of things to this. So first the choir. If you do something like that, you will see that in the other examples as well. It's always nice when something repeats almost identically, it's always nice to change it up in the second half a little bit to just keep it interesting. That's what that is sounding like together. it adds a little bit of drama. Then something else I did is um, in order to pull the orchestra and frequency range a little further apart still uh, and fill up that low end, I usually layer a sine wave or um, some low uh, frequency synthesizer under the bass line. So this is what that's going to sound like. It's very subtle, but it adds some, it, it opens it up a little further. And then um, I added percussion. As usual, I add percussion and keys and all that stuff last. So the first thing I added was um, the piano. I actually wanted to just double that. Another thing I added is this harp. And this is going to be really subtle. You're not really going to hear much of that. It's really just kind of more to fill up the sound. Even in a live context, if everybody's playing forte, it's not like you're going to be hearing that. Um, and then in order to reinforce that, I also had the celeste and vibraphone play that in across octaves just to, you know, add a color, add some more fullness to it. This is what that sounds like. and so forth. This goes together with the harp, of course. And then the rest is really just, I added timpani. 
um, to the baseline. And then I added a couple of swells and hits just where the melody starts and then where the second half starts. So that's it. That's all of it. I did not add a ton of percussion because it doesn't really go with this piece, at least not in this arrangement. So this is what the whole thing sounds like. That's the whole magic of that one. But you can see whatever first choice you make in the orchestration, in this case, the first choice would be where does the melody go? That kind of creates a cascade of follow-up decisions that you have to make depending on what range the melody is in and the loudness of the instruments, what the instruments can do, etc. Now, what if I say, okay, I don't want this full orchestra lush version. I want the melody to be in the tenor range, in a tenor instrument. Let's say in this case, the celli, right? So then that would sound like this. That would be the first choice. So now I'm having the melody in a lower range. That's what this sounds like. Now let's think about what problems arise from doing that. First of all, if you have too much bass in there, that's going to get in the way, right? The second thing is a tenor melody cutting through is much harder than a soprano melody cutting through. So everyone else now needs to get out of the way of that cello and out of that tenor range to really make room for that melody to breathe. It's kind of almost like EQing, like orchestration is a little bit like mixing in a way where you have to think about, okay, in what frequency range does this sit and how do I get everything else out of the way to make room for this frequency range so that it can actually breathe and be heard. So the first thing I decided was to not have an arco bass, but to have a pizzicato bass to go with the celli because that would mean that we have a lot of breathing room down there in the low frequencies, right? It makes a lot more room for the cello to come out. So that's what this is going to sound like. Right? We get the nice melody and it really has its own shine now. We still get the bass line, but since the bass line is sonically so different and thinner and out of the way, it does not interfere with the range of the cello in this case. So then obviously the question is what do we do with the high strings because they can't get in the way either. So what I did was basically have a high arpeggio going on if I did this live, I would probably even have the high strings put on mutes to mellow them out 
and to really leave the only the cello portion crisp and you know expressive so that um, everything else stays out of the way but if you look just look at it look at where the line is in the cello and how far away I'm keeping the high strings and the bass it's basically there's at least what a fifth on the top and on the bottom that is not utilized because that way we can leave room for the cello to breathe so this is what it sounds like with the high strings now filling in the harmonies but away from the cello line <laughs> Right, so that works. Technically everything is there. The bass line is there, the melody is there, and the harmonies are there. So what did I do next? I wanted to support this high line with the woodwinds because especially in mock-ups, it sounds a little thin. It sounds a little bit better life to do this. But so I support that with the high woodwinds and then I support the melody with the bassoons. It's very common to double the um, celli with the bassoons sounds very nice. So this is what the woodwinds sound like in this context. And then together with the strings, it sounds like this. See, and this already works. It, it would sound a little bit better live. Um, but so this is already, you know, a good way to go about it. I have not um, actually used any brass in this one. You could, I guess, you could double the melody. You couldn't really double that string arpeggio with anything. I just didn't feel the need because this is such a delicate arrangement to begin with. So I feel like brass has no business being here. Um, but so the next thing I did is I actually used uh, the same harp line as before, this one. Right, didn't even have to redo that. And then in the rest of the percussion, I also reused that, but I doubled the high strings, the arpeggio in the celeste, because especially in something that is delicate and magical like this one, um, that always kind of works really well. It sounds like this. <laughs> feel like that could already be its own piece <laughs> sounds kind of nice but so all together with the pitched percussion and the harp on top it sounds like this
And there we go. That's the whole magic. Stay out of the way if you're going to put the melody into the tenor range. Everyone else needs to do something else, hopefully a little further away from that melody. Don't clog it up because especially in that frequency range, you don't want stuff to be too close together to begin with, but especially not if the melody is there. Don't clog it up there. You gotta leave room in your arrangement for it. Then we have our next scenario. The next scenario, uh, problem child woodwinds. Um, I thought, okay, what if I have the melody in the flute, right? Not a particularly loud instrument, so what do we do to stay under that? Also, this version is a little Christmassy, but whatever. It's Nightmare Before Christmas. Also, I was working on the Klaus family when I did this, so... <laughs> I had the sleigh bells locked and loaded. But so this is what it sounds like um, with the flute melody. And so forth, we know it by now. Um, really good range for the flute like this is actually a pretty perfect range um, and then in the second half i decided to double it up with oboe just to add an extra color like i said before i like to switch things up a little bit um, in the second half also doubling flute with oboe usually gives it a little bit more presence Right? And then I thought, okay, if I'm not going to be doubling the melody with clarinet as well, what could the clarinets do? And so I decided to kind of have an arpeggio going on that kind of answers the melody to give them something to do and to add a little bit more color and movement into the arrangement. So that's what this sounds like. Right? It's kind of nice when woodwinds interlock and play together. Um, at least I think that. It's a question of taste. You wouldn't have to do that. It's more of a N was feeling this. So <laughs> there we go. Um, then I decided, you know, with the woodwinds, the problem now is everybody else needs to get out of the way. So no brass. Because, <laughs> um, I mean, what's the point? Uh, so in the strings, I really only have the bass line played regularly. That's what this sounds like. And then I decided um, to have the rest of the strings just play chord sustains, play them tremolo. And normally, if this were going to an orchestra, I would decide to have them play, have the entire string section play sordino and piano or pianissimo. So this is really just to kind of create a texture under the woodwinds without covering them up too much. So that's what this is going to sound like.
You could also have these play Arco instead of Tremolo. That would be fine too. Um, I just wanted a different articulation to try out. But so this stays pretty well out of the way of um, the woodwinds, especially because the arrangement also sits under the woodwinds. Let me actually mark these all down and listen to them in context. Here we go. See, everything else... The strings sit under the woodwinds and only mildly overlap with that arpeggio in the clarinets so that really we get to hear the woodwinds on the top. One other way to do this would have been to just have the strings play pizzicato or something, but um, that would obviously be a very different vibe to what I did. And then, <laughs> like I said, I went Christmas on this one. So I added harp harmonics, sound like this. It's just kind of a color. Um, but then I also added handbells that are doing something similar. Right? It's getting very Christmassy. And then I, I just couldn't resist. I added Glockenspiel, which the Cineper Glockenspiel is not great have to find another one. I don't know what they recorded there. It sounds like a toy glockenspiel. <laughs> like the one you would buy for kids for $10. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, I'll, I'll find a different one. Right, and then I kind of just kept going on with the bells. So this is the celeste. We already had this movement before. And then um, triangles, tambourines, and sleigh bells doing this. That's it. It's just a bunch of bells added to what I've done with the strings and woodwinds. So all together, it sounds like this. Right, very Christmassy, but hey, <laughs> I just went for it. Um, those are decisions you probably should make beforehand. Um, it's just, since this is not for a specific movie, I just went with whatever I felt like. So <laughs> that was that. Now, I was like, well, okay, we, we now have a bunch of um, lush versions. What if I did an action version of this very same thing? Um, first thing you have to decide for, again, is um, where does the melody go? So I figured I've neglected the horns a little bit and epic horns in an action cue always kind of works. So that's where I put the melody.
perfect range also for the horns, um, interestingly. And then I at first I did not do anything else with the brass. So the first thing I ended up doing was uh, do the strings to the horns. Um, because now, naturally, the strings kind of have to, if it's an action cue, there has to be movement. So the first thing I did was uh, add the bass line, but this time in a kind of rhythmic way. And these little triplet things are really the only thing I added composition-wise. <laughs> You can also see I changed the rhythm again a little bit in the second half to make it less boring. And then for the for the end, I actually had to add a bunch of sustains here. Da -da -da. There you go. So that's the low strings and the horns. So now I wanted um, ostinatos and arpeggios in the high strings. So what I ended up doing is, how do I explain this best? I basically make the horn line visible. So I take the horn line and I take the bass line. And then I'm like, okay, this looks pretty good. There's a lot of room. Um, but so now I want to make sure that all the arpeggios I do uh, don't interfere with the horn line too much. So this is violin, the violin one arpeggio. You can see it's on top of the horn line. It never crosses the horn line and it never doubles the horn line. Um, and then I have the second violins. At first they double the first violins and then they split out um, here. But even the second violins only rarely cross into the horn line. And if they do, it's only into the melody. Um, so they would only be reinforcing the melody. And then the violas I have under the horn and it also, I don't think at any given point does it cross the horn line. So we're basically leaving everything again spread out either on top of the melody or below the melody. Now this one needs less space than the tenor melody because um, in this range melodies tend to cut through better and also the horns cut through anyway so it's a little less important um, if there are crossovers or there's not you know a ton of space but I still like to construct my pieces in a way that um, there is enough space so let me just play you the strings and what they do you can even see where the gap is for the melody here <laughs> Like it's visually there. Um, but so let's only play this without the melody and then I'll play it with. So that adds a nice level of movement here. You can see again, second half, I changed it up a little bit because I wanted more energy here. So I changed the rhythm and added more harmonies and DVC. Um, the one thing I did notice here is that it gets a little dense. And so I was worried that we're not going to be hearing the melody 100%. And so what I ended up doing is I took the violas, which is common, you can divisi the violas or celli, depending on where the melody sits, and double the horns a little bit. So I just did that to reinforce the horns in the second half because I kind of felt like, you know, this might get a little too cluttered for the horns to still be cutting through properly. So this is the strings and the horns together. <laughs>
And I ended with tremolo strings. I just took those from the previous cue because I was too lazy. Then I added some symphobia stabs here just to reinforce the bass line of the downbeat, basically. It's like mixed brass strings and percussion. Um, I also reinforce that here in the piano. Right. Uh, so we got that. Then I went back into the brass and also added those stabs in the low brass. So we got that. Let's play through that so far so you can actually hear it. And this is usually where you can hear it come together. We haven't even added percussion yet, which is done on purpose because um, especially in action cues, I want to make sure they work without percussion first. Uh, I think I've said this in a different video already. So then um, all I did in the woodwinds was double the strings because I mean, what else are they going to do? You don't technically need them, but why not? Um, so there's that. Listen to it. It's so noisy. Um, so here in this part, um, for the flutes, I've kept this double thing that I did, like the double time, because um, they can do double tongue. But for the oboe, I actually changed it to just be one, because oboes don't like to do double tongue. It doesn't really matter in the mock-up, but if it goes to a live orchestra, I would probably not have them do that. Um, so let's listen to that together. <laughs> And then the last thing I add before I add the percussion is the trumpets. Now, the trumpets could just double the melody, it's fine. But I wanted, you know, to add a little bit of movement and a little bit of, um, you know, these little trumpet throw-ins to kind of drive some forward movement and, you know, get some more, um, yeah, just movement and colors in there uh, instead of staying boring. So what I ended up doing is this. It makes more sense in context. This is what it sounds like all together. Right? 
it just adds a little bit of uh, pizzazz to the thing. And then I finally get to the percussion. Um, so the first thing I added was timpani, just reinforcing the bass. Right? Nothing special about that. Then I added a bunch of snares and like brushes and stuff, buckets, um, this stuff, basically. And so forth a bunch of toms are in there and then i actually loaded um, some extra toms from la modern percussion right here to double up those toms to make them a little more uh, crisp is that the right word i don't know they just cut through a little bit better i generally find the la modern percussion cuts through a little bit better than Armageddon Ensemble damage. But hey, you know, we all mix and match. Um, then I added a bunch of piadi and cymbals, just like I did before. Like that. And then um, I also loaded, um, I don't know what it's called, shakers and tickies or something. Uh, also from LA Modern Percussion, and I added, I filtered them to only have the high frequencies of these, because LA Modern Percussion generally has a lot of, it's very frequency loaded, even the high percussion, um, which is sort of nice, but in a, in a context, you kind of have to filter out what you need, or filter out what you don't need, so you're only left with what you need. So for this, I only wanted um, the higher frequencies, and then I put Echo Boy, as a ping pong delay on it, so this is what that sounds like. Right, just adding a little bit of movement to it. So the whole percussion sounds like this. It's not the most realistic timpani line, but I don't usually record timpani, so I don't care. Uh, normally, like four or five timpani would be at a session, I think. So <laughs> you'd be a little limited in what you can do. Um, but not my problem, because we're not recording this. So whatever can do as long as if it stays in the markup, you can do whatever the hell you want. So that's the whole piece. So this is what it sounds like all together. I think I, I might like this the most. I don't know. And then we come to uh, the last one, which <laughs> I don't think it works as well as I thought it would work, to be honest. But I still want to showcase it because you can still learn from a not so great example. Um, I think had I done this in a, in a different key, it might have worked. I think it's too low for the choir. Because the melody is really an alto melody, and I think it would have worked better in a soprano. But for that, I would have had to transpose the piece. But I kind of only noticed that 
later on. But as I wanted to do a choir and pipe organ version and it just kind of didn't work. <laughs> that, that's, the, that's the honest uh, truth here. It did not turn out the way it was in my head. But so I recorded myself singing a little bit and also having MIDI vocals here. Um, so yeah, let, let's listen to the vocals first. So you can see what the initial idea was that then did not work out. <laughs> Like it's not terrible, but I don't love it, you know? I don't know. Maybe with the real choir it would have worked. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not super impressed by this one. But so then I um, put a, a pipe organ under it. That's what this sounds like. was supposed to be the ultimate Halloween version and it just isn't. Um, then I loaded another organ with more registers pulled and this one is just playing the melody basically on top of um, the pipe organ you just heard uh, and then it starts playing arpeggios in the second half because as before I just started varying things a little bit in the second half. <laughs> guess it's fine. I'm liking it more than I did when I made it, but I'm still not loving it. Then the harp, I just copied this from the beginning again, it's the same thing. Right? So then I, then I started adding strings, and I think this is also where things went south. Um, so the first thing I started adding was harmonics because I figured, you know, that would be kind of cool with a pipe organ to have harmonics on top. And it kind of works, but it also kind of doesn't. Um, let's listen to it. <laughs> still not loving it <laughs> and then I um, added the rest of the strings and so what they're doing is um, the bass is playing the bass line the celli are playing these arpeggios and then later I um, in the second half I have the I think violins double the melody as well and then the cello goes into octaves with the bass so that's what this is and so forth. 
Um, and so, yeah. Mm, together, it sounds like this. <laughs> I don't love it anyway so then in the woodwinds I just ended up the bassoons ended up doubling the celli um, and then the clarinets double up the melody like so I think I also, I kept doubling the melody because I just didn't feel like it was coming out enough because it's in the alto range. I should have put it in the soprano. Anyway, a classic example of made a bad choice at the beginning and now the rest is just trying to solve that problem. Uh, see, the horns I also in the second half have double the melody. It's because I feel like it's so buried, especially under the pipe organ because it's too low. Uh, I believe I copied these from the other arrangements, yeah. Yeah. And then in this one, I added tubular bells as well. Tubular, tubular, tu bells. Cause I wanted that Halloween feel and it just kind of didn't work out but so <laughs> this is what the whole thing sounds like it's okay it's not great <laughs> And there we go, that's five different versions, same melody, same chords, same everything. I think some of these turn out better than others. Um, again, the MIDI is going to be up on Buy Me a Coffee. And, you know, don't think these are the only ways to do this. I mean, there's like three million other ways that you could have orchestrated this. And the moment we went venture outside of um, orchestra instruments, there's another three million ways of doing it. So. This is just five random examples. This is also something I do at the beginning of a project when I'm in that idea finding project. Once I have my theme, this is kind of what I do with the theme. I will just have, you know, eight bars or 16 bars of that theme. And then I will just, depending on the movie and what the movie needs, I will go in and kind of do different versions of it and kind of have a session similar to this one, similar to what this looks like right now, where I will just have, it's not going to be this random, like it's actually going to be tailored to the movie that I'm writing to. So I will already know, okay, I'm going to need like this type of version here and I'm going to need an action adventure version here. So I've already seen the film at that point. But then I will take my theme and kind of do versions of the theme that I know I'm going to need later. And so once I get to a scene that is using this theme, I can then be like, okay, for this one, I'm going to pick this and then just expand on that. So um, I don't really have to start anything from scratch or come up with new ideas because this is kind of the development phase where you come up with these thoughts and also the phase where you can see what doesn't work like that entire last bit I don't know if I would be using that or if I were to use that I would have to rearrange it to be different um, 
so this is also a good time in the project to already figure out what's not going to work and what needs to be redone or rearranged or just simply what you're not going to be using because it didn't turn out the way it was in your mind. So yeah, this is a good way to practice orchestration. I do it all the time. Um, one way I also do it is I will, like, I will simply grab something from IMSLP and um, you can either mark it up or you just take the piano reduction of it and then just be like, okay, what if I orchestrated this as Beethoven in this piece? What if I orchestrated like Danny Elfman in this piece? What if I orchestrate this like John Williams in this piece? You know, and then just kind of try out these different things um, without changing anything. So you already have the melody, you already have the harmony and everything is already there. And you're really just focusing on the orchestration and try to um, mimic or redo what other people have done and kind of see how that applies. Um, and then usually along those lines, you also come up with something new or you will discover something new. And also your mock-up chops are going to get better if you do that. So that's how I used to practice orchestration. That's how I still practice orchestration. Um, by simply doing, <laughs> doing it in the DAW um, and really trying things out. Or you can obviously also do it in notation software. If you have something like Note Performer, you can get pretty close to a good quality sound example. So you can do that too. Anyway, bottom line here is go practice.